A simple nullity. Three words which have damned the man who uttered them to become the most despised judge in New Zealand history. And I think in terms of Prendergast's reputation, he's been unfortunate that it happened to be about what is now confirmed as our founding document. In fact, that quote is so famous, at least in New Zealand legal circles, that it was used in a parody video put together by Auckland University law students. Yeah, is it too late now to say sorry? We know the treaty was more than a nullity. Is it too late now to say sorry? You should watch the full video of that parody on YouTube, by the way. It's, it's fantastic. I'll put up a link on the webpage. Anyway. Maybe we should back up a bit. The simple nullity quote referred, of course, to the Treaty of Waitangi and was part of a ruling which helped justify the separation of Māori from their land for more than a hundred years. Other words in that ruling included primitive barbarians and savages. The man behind those words is Sir James Prendergast, Chief Justice of New Zealand from 1875 to 1899. Definitely from our perspective he is a racist and for some during that time, he would have been seen as, as as that as well. A lot of the views that he has, of course, at the time were commonly held. Grant Morris is a legal historian from Victoria University. His most recent book is James Prendergast, Legal Villain? And yes, you did hear a question mark at the end of that title. The reason the question mark is there is partly because during his lifetime, from the majority of the colonial uh, community, he was much liked, uh, whereas today he really is as close as we've got probably to a legal villain. So that view changes over time, and what I was trying to work out is, you know, what 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 is there to this guy beyond just the simple nullity quote, and how can we judge whether someone's a villain or not historically? So how do you go about becoming New Zealand's top legal villain? Prendergast's story begins in London. He was born there in December 1826. His father was a successful lawyer who went on to be a judge. So upper middle class would be, I think, the correct terminology. So he has a privileged uh, background in the sense that he goes to the public or private school uh, in Britain. He goes to Cambridge University. Uh, He goes to the inns of court and he becomes a barrister. So... While not part of the aristocracy uh, or the gentry, he is privileged, he has all the educational and professional advantages one could wish for. Prendergast wasn't content to follow in his father's footsteps and start a legal career straight away. He and his two older brothers had a nose for adventure, and they were swept up in gold rush fever when the precious metal was first discovered in Melbourne, Australia in the 1850s. It really is part of that that gold rush mania where you know, young men would come from Britain or other uh, colonies or other areas to to the, the, the gold rush of the moment. And Prendergast and one of his brothers uh, nearly dies on the on the gold fields through basically an experience and ineptitude and is saved um, really by his elder brother, Michael. Prendergast's brush with death on the Victoria gold fields left him disillusioned. For a while, he held down a clerical job in Melbourne while recovering from dysentery. But fairly quickly, he took a ship back to London and tried to forge a career as a lawyer. He's admitted to the bar, but London is jam-packed with lawyers, and when his father dies, his connections dry up, and he struggles to find work. That's when he hears of another gold rush. This time it's in New Zealand, and this time he's armed with experience from his failed adventure in Australia. During that time, as a as a as a gold would be gold miner, and then as an administrator, kind of in a in a clerical position, Prendergast learns how gold rushes operate and where to best position yourself in a gold rush to guarantee you're going to make money. So when he comes to the Otago gold rush in the early 1860s, he comes as a lawyer and becomes affluent very quickly. Because that's the thing about gold rushes, right, is the miners never make the money. (laughs) Yeah, unless you're the first one. (laughs) Yeah, it's the people who are selling stuff to them. Absolutely. And Mm. what was the sort of demand for lawyers like in Dunedin at the time? Classic um, boom town. So gold is discovered early 1860s. Dunedin goes from a sleepy little town of Presbyterian Scottish immigrants to the third great gold rush, you know, San Francisco or California, Victoria. Otago, and Prendergast is the right man in the right place at the right moment. Uh, They need, not only do they need lawyers, but they need lawyers who have got experience, especially the sort of experience you can get in London. 
So Prendergast comes with that experience and he rises, you know, he's rises to the top within, you know, a few years he's Attorney General. I mean, his rise to Attorney General is just astonishingly fast. Mm. Like, you can't, can you imagine if that happened today? Someone, you know, out of law school, you know, doesn't have much luck in their home country, pops to New Zealand a few years later, they're the top lawyer in the country. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, that is a, it's a classic colonial example as well, where they just don't have the people with the experience uh, to fill these roles, or at least they have only a few, so there's not a lot of competition for those roles. So, you know, there were a number of lawyers in New Zealand at the time, but how many of them had Cambridge, Inns of Court, Father was a judge, you know, flash um, schooling? Prendergast was one of the few. So as long as he didn't stuff things up or, uh, you know, deviate too far from the kind of um, establishment line, I think you could pretty much guarantee he was going to rise to the top. But at this point in time, towing the establishment line meant getting involved in the bloody series of conflicts which we now call the New Zealand Wars. The government Prendergast was acting for was busy battling Māori rebels, illegally confiscating land and committing the occasional atrocity against Māori fighters and civilians. There's no doubt that during this time as Attorney General Prendergast was a very valuable member of that government establishment which was trying to put down these rebellions. I mean, mm. he essentially gave sort of legal sanction for what today have been described by some people as war crimes. Yeah, and then yeah, and even today, the, the, a lot of the debate comes over what you define as a war crime. Back back then it was debated in Parliament as well, you know, what, what, the, what the colonial forces were doing, uh, again, especially in the latter stages of the New Zealand wars, you know, was it beyond the bounds of law? Mm. Uh, and Prendergast was tied up in that because he was definitely on the side of taking increasingly harsh action mm. towards Te Kuti and Te Tukawaru and the other uh, Māori leaders in arms against the Crown. And that reputation stays with him. The language of some of Prendergast's legal opinions during the New Zealand wars is brutal. Here's a quote. The Māoris, now in arms, have put forward no grievance for which they seek redress. Their objective, so far as can be collected from their acts, is murder, cannibalism and rape. They form themselves into bands and roam the country seeking prey. That is pretty grim stuff. I mean, sure, soldiers and warriors on both sides did some pretty horrific things, but to say Māori had never put forward any grievance and were just in it for the sheer pleasure of rape and murder, that's nonsense. But you could argue that it's kind of Prendergast's job to say those sort of things. What becomes difficult at this point for a lawyer and for a a legal historian is how much can we say this is Prendergast and how much can we say this is a person fulfilling their constitutional or legal role? Mm. Because especially when he's giving legal advice to the government, he's the government's lawyer. So he's acting as a lawyer. He's saying this is these are the precedents, Mm. this is the law, this is how I think it applies to the facts. There are a couple of ways we can work out to what extent was he reflective of the age and of other people in those positions. So we can compare him to some of the others, like Robert Stout, for example. Um, And we can also look at the language and see how much the language is common for that time or different. And I think there were definitely people in the colony at at the time who saw his opinions as being overly harsh, as being definitely uh, towards the extreme end um, of what the law might allow the government to do. And some would have seen them as not even uh, abiding by you know, the law of the time. So why did Prendergast take such a hard line on Māori during the New Zealand wars? Unfortunately, the answer isn't that complicated. He was a good example of a, of a colonialist and a leading colonial figure who never got to the point of understanding, I think, the impact of what had happened on Māori and also the legitimacy of the grievances that Māori had. I think what also it shows to us, especially this period we're talking about, which is really 1865 through the early 1870s, is just how vicious that war had become mm-hmm. and how polarising it was. And the damage from that war goes on for decades, you could argue even longer, Mm. uh, in terms of polarising Māori Pākehā 
Prendergast directly benefited from his ill-treatment of Māori financially through his ownership of confiscated land and politically by supporting the colonial establishment. That political support, together with his proven ability as a lawyer, helped him take his next big step. In 1875, Prendergast is appointed Chief Justice of New Zealand. As a judge, he presided over several extremely famous cases. Te Fiti, the great Māori pacifist, he heard the appeal of Minnie Dean, the infamous baby farmer. Prendergast was actually one of the judges on the judicial panel which acquitted Thomas Hall for murder. You might remember that from last week's episode. But by far the most famous case he was involved in is Widamu Parata versus the Bishop of Wellington, which is where we get his infamous simple nullity quote. He heard this case alongside a fellow judge called Richmond. Widamu Parata, who was a, a leading chief from Ngāti Toa up in the um, Porirua area, that iwi had gifted land to the Anglican Church to build a school in, in that area, and the school had never been built. And so, quite understandably, the tribe asks for the land back again. If you're not using it, can we please have it back? You know, it's our land. But in the in the intervening years between gifting the land and wanting it back, the Crown had issued a Crown grant, which was really a stamp of, of approval, legal stamp of approval, saying that, you know, the Crown is going to give this land to the Anglican Church. At its simplest, the Widamu Porata case is a contest of crown grant versus native title. Native title is basically legalese for the fact that indigenous people, in this case Māori, own land they're living on. A crown grant is the right of the government to say this person gets this land because the crown says so. This part of the case is pretty straightforward. Crown grant beats native title because the crown has sovereignty. Hard luck Māori. But... Where does that power come from to issue these crown grants and to extinguish native title in the way that occurred in this case? Well, it comes from the sovereignty that the crown has over New Zealand. And where does that sovereignty come from? Well, Prendergast said, and Prendergast and Richmond said, it comes from discovery and occupation. It doesn't come from the treaty because, and to quote uh, the, the case, insofar as the treaty purported to cede sovereignty, it was a simple nullity. So far, Prendergast and his fellow judge Richmond are sort of on the straight and narrow, legally speaking. The treaty hadn't been formally incorporated into New Zealand law, so you could argue they were correct when they said Parliament sovereignty didn't come from the treaty. But Prendergast actually goes further than that and he says, well, it's not even a proper international treaty because to have a proper international treaty, you've got to have capacity. You've got to have the capacity or sovereignty to cede in the first place. And he said Māori didn't have that capacity because they were primitive barbarians and savages. But is he basing that on anything? Like, I mean, (laughs) you know, I mean, obviously it's obvious from our position today that Māori we're in a position mm. to have capacity to mm. understand mm. what was going mm. on. But how was Prendergast able to, you know, prove that Māori were so barbaric and savage that they couldn't possibly understand this document which they signed? Mm. So this is, this is where I think you get to the part of the decision where it becomes much harder to say, here's a judge applying the law. Yeah. Uh, and it becomes a, a, a judge's view, uh, you know, societal view or view of race. Uh, and it's, you know, Prendergast and Richmond saying that there is kind of a hierarchy of, of civilizations and that Māori were down near the bottom and that their society didn't have um, the ability or the sophistication to be able to enter into a treaty or even know uh, what, what was going on. And that reflects, a, you know, that reflects a prevailing view at the time, not by all at the time, but by many at the time that European society was superior to a society like Māori. What's more, it's a blatant double standard. When he was Attorney General, Prendergast justified horrific actions against Māori on the basis that the New Zealand wars were not a war of conquest, that Māori were British citizens in rebellion. That meant Māori fighters weren't soldiers, they were criminals. So the government didn't have to give them the protection soldiers normally get under the laws of war. How can you simultaneously say that Māori are smart enough to understand their British citizens, but too ignorant to understand concepts like ceding sovereignty? So, yeah, you've, 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 you've um, probably answered in the sense that it's a, it's, a, it's a double standard. And remember, of course, this is the Victorian era. Yeah. <laughs> it's the era of the double standard. Again, we get to this question of motivation. 
I was interested to see what a Māori historian made of this, so I went up the road at Victoria University to talk to Peter Adds, Associate Professor for Te Kawa a Māori School of Māori Studies. I think he probably knew what he was doing. He was essentially racist at heart, uh, and he wanted to find a, um, a way to keep the Māori population um, subdued. But Peter Adds, like Grant Morris, stresses the importance of seeing this simple nullity decision in its wider context. There was a definite uh, change in attitude from the Crown about notions of Māori custom law, from an early attitude that basically said, yes, we recognise that there is Māori custom law in New Zealand uh, and that Europeans that live here will live here according to that body of law, not a British style of law. Uh, later on they realised after the treaty was signed that Māori people had no intention of giving up their sovereignty like they thought they should because of the English version of the treaty document uh, and determined that that needed to be changed but how would they change it? Uh, and there were discussions again between uh, Crown officials notably including Richmond uh, who was engaged in those discussions at that time um, that um, they could probably do that by as they put it, insinuating or inducing the acceptance of a British style of law in New Zealand. And that seems to have been the attitude through uh, the late uh, 19, uh, 1850s through to the start of the New Zealand Wars in 1860, uh, right through, in fact, to Prendergast's 1877 decision. But at the time, nobody in the Pākehā press was interested in the long-running constitutional implications of the Wiparata case. In fact, the verdict barely rated a mention in the newspapers. They were too busy reporting breathlessly on another story involving Prendergast, his bitter personal feud with Weeparata's lawyer, an Irishman called George Barton. That feud got so hot that at one stage the Weeparata case was actually put on hold to deal with it, which says something for priorities at the time. Barton was angry that he didn't get appointed to the bench. He thought he was a leading lawyer at the time and he should have been Chief Justice, and Prendergast got it instead. That manifested itself in him believing that Prendergast was biased towards his clients. And so the two, the three actually, because he, he, he feuds with Richmond as well, the judges and Barton go back and forward and court arguing with each other, Barton accusing them of, of being biased. The feud must have been frustrating for Prendergast because while Barton was publicly slamming him and accusing him of bias in the press, as a judge, Prendergast couldn't retaliate publicly. The dispute boils over the year after the Weeparata case in 1878, when Prendergast ruled against one of Barton's clients. Barton refused to accept the ruling and kept speaking over Prendergast when he was trying to read his ruling. Prendergast was furious. Mr Barton, I have many times requested you to keep your seat and not to interrupt the proceedings of the court. Notwithstanding such reiterated orders and rules, you have continued interrupting the proceedings, and therefore I dictate that unless you see fit to apologise to the court and express regret for such transgressions, you will be judged guilty of contempt of court. Contempt of court, by the way, is a very serious charge, but that doesn't stop Barton. It must be heard. It's monstrous that the court... interrupting the court while it's delivering its judgment. I was very desirous indeed that you should have regretted your conduct. But this mode of procedure must end. It's perfectly clear. It must be stopped in some way. I know what the court means, and I hope it knows what I mean. The court judges you guilty of contempt of court and commits you to the public prison in Wellington for one month. But even this doesn't stop Barton's feuding. While he's still in prison, he runs for Parliament and wins. He's elected as the MP for Wellington Central. He continues the feud, he tries to take it through the Parliament, tries to basically remove the judges, which is a very, very difficult thing to do mm. in New Zealand. Probably for good reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he fails. And eventually he annoys pretty much everyone. And it's him that loses the feud and has to go off um, away. And he's basically 
forced out of the country, isn't he? Yeah, well, he's made so many enemies at this, at this point of time that I, I think it's fair to say he probably carried it on a little bit too long and mm. people just got tired of it. But the damage is, 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 is to, to Prendergast and Richmond as well, at least in the short term. Mm. Um, they, you know, judges don't like that sort of publicity, mm. uh, especially claims of bias are, are particularly uh, damaging. It's not the last big scandal to engulf Prendergast. He also played a central role in the invasion of Parihaka in 1881, when 1,600 armed police raided a peaceful settlement which had been set up to protest the confiscation of Māori land. The government had wanted to take action against the protesters for a long time, but they were being blocked by the governor, Sir Arthur Gordon, who was taking the protesters' side. But when the governor took a trip to Fiji... Prendergast stepped in as acting governor and signed off on the Parihaka raid just hours before Gordon was due to arrive back in Wellington. Again, we run into the same question we had when Prendergast was Attorney General and when he was Chief Justice. Is he culpable for the government's actions or is he just doing his job? You've got to work out where the balance is. Is it Prendergast just saying, I'm the acting governor, I'm going to do as I, I, I'm told because that's my constitutional duty? Or is it that and, yeah, actually, yeah, I'm quite happy to sign off this invasion? And given Prendergast's past history, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't support him very well in terms of, of absolving him. The other question is whether the invasion of Parihaka would have happened anyway, even if Prendergast had refused to authorise it as acting governor. I think there probably would have come a point where the government would have risked the constitutional crisis, you know, to to, to try and push it through. And Gordon would have either had to have signed it uh, unwillingly, but, you know, signed it or potentially they they would have forced a recall and Gordon may have had to go back to London and and a new governor come in, uh, which would have been messy. So this definitely suited uh, suited the, the purposes of the executive. Prendergast's role in Parihaka was supported by the majority of colonial New Zealand. But there were some condemnations. Governor Gordon was furious at Prendergast and the liberal Littleton Times wrote this about the incident. The low cunning characteristic of this whole proceeding leads us to suppose that its conception must have originated in the mind of the Attorney General Frederick Whitaker. What we are surprised at is that Sir James Prendergast if he knew the likelihood of the immediate return of the governor, should have lent himself to such a discreditable piece of finesse behind the governor's back. If the name Frederick Whitaker pricked your memory, you get a gold star. We talked about his role in the Waikato Wars in last season's episode on Thomas Russell. Prendergast saw condemnation like this throughout his legal career from Māori and their Pākehā supporters. Here's a quote from Dom Felice Vagioli, a Benedictine monk who lived in New Zealand while Prendergast was Chief Justice. <clears throat> Prendergast was a bitter enemy of the Māori. His contemptuous scorn for the Treaty of Waitangi and for the rights of Māori, who were British subjects, was clearly demonstrated by him when government compensation for Māori was discussed. He had the gall to write that Māori had no right to be treated humanely. And this man was the colony's chief judge. Justice had fallen into such disreputable hands. This view of Prendergast as sort of the arch-villain, the arch-enemy of Māori, the man who sort of laid the last blow which destroyed hopes for the Treaty of Waitangi granting Māori any power over their own lands and sovereignty, has become by far the dominant view today. But Grant Morris, while not saying that that reputation is undeserved, thinks that it possibly overstates Prendergast's significance in New Zealand history. Prendergast was one person in what was a group of people who were settling New Zealand Mm -hmm. and were operating in part of a settler society setting up basically a legal system for settlers. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, they saw Māori as being in the way. So in that sense, you can understand the anger at someone like Prendergast from today, but to have it all directed at Prendergast is, is, is out of, of proportion. Do you think there's any, like, moral <laughs> to this? I know, I know historians hate finding morals. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. I think that the moral of the, of the story is, it's not even, I wouldn't even call it a moral, but perhaps one of the key insights is to how damaging it can be when you have people making 
decisions, whether as attorney general or or as a judge, about another you know, ethnic group or another group in society which they have absolutely no understanding about, mm. and whether it's you know whether it's the language that's used or the severity of 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 the decision or the judgment or the opinion, you can see that here are people who just don't get it. Mm. Um, you've got to, and it's you know it's this, I, th- I find it a very kind of depressing part of New Zealand's history, that 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, you see, you know, what started with some promise in 1840s and 1850s ripped apart. Um, and I think we still leave, you know, live with the legacy of, of that. Is it too late now to say sorry? We know the treaty was more than a nullity. Special thanks to Grant Morris and Peter Adds at Victoria University. If you like this show, please take the time to subscribe. You can do that on iTunes via RNZ smartphone app or by going to rnz.co.nz and clicking the series and podcast page and navigating to Black Sheep. While you're on our website, check out Forecast, a panel show where comedians try to predict the headlines of the coming week all in front of a live audience. The latest episode features an old schoolmate of mine, Pax Asadi, who I can personally testify as a very funny man, Hillcrest High School represent. Next week is the final episode of Black Sheep for this year, and we'll be looking at the blackest sheep of them all. Well, at least by one metric. It seems to me that they probably killed at least 20. Potentially, he he was New Zealand's worst um, serial killer, you could say. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and this episode was engineered by William Saunders. We had voice acting help from Duncan Smith, Adam McCauley, and Patrick O'Mara.